Hello again to all who's listening. I trust and hope that the message uh, today finds you well and that you've known the Lord's blessing and the Lord's help and encouragement over the past week since we uh, last uh, spoke to you. And again, we're coming to the book of Ruth. This morning, we're continuing with our little series in the book of Ruth and to the second chapter. So Ruth chapter 2, we're finishing off uh, this chapter uh, this morning. And uh, God willing, next Lord's Day, we will be moving into chapter 3. So Ruth chapter 2, and beginning to read at verse number 18. And she took it up, and she went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. This was just after Ruth had sat at the table uh, and had a meal with Boaz. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And Ruth the Moabites said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men, until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest, and dwelt with her mother-in-law. We'll end the reading there, and we trust the Lord will give us a blessing again as we uh, consider his word. Shall we bow in a moment's prayer? Father, we thank thee again just for another time. Uh, that we can gather around thy word. We long, our Father, just still to be able to meet uh, as a company of thy dear people uh, in the assembly. But we just pray, Lord, and thank thee for thy hand of blessing upon our little country over the past number of weeks. We thank thee, Father, that the outlook of deaths uh, is not going to be as bad. And we just want to give thee thanks for that. And just pray, O God, that in this time many have turned uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. So, Lord, we praise thee for thy blessing and for thy provision and protection upon our little country again. And we just ask, O God, as we come to thy word, that thou would give us an understanding, that the Holy Spirit would open up our minds and our hearts to take it in, and pray that the Lord Jesus might be glorified in everything we would seek to do. We pray these things, our Father, in the Saviour's precious and worthy name. Amen. Now, over our uh, past two studies, as you know together, we have been looking at this field, the field in which Ruth entered for the first time and all the blessings that came to her through this wonderful man called Boaz. And we saw the field is a picture of salvation. Ruth found grace in the eyes of, of one who spoke favourably to her. She had never met him in her life. But I'm sure as she saw his stately step, her heart was strangely warmed. You remember there, just up the passage in chapter 2, he came to her, came to the field from Bethlehem, and I think that's lovely. There he touched the life of a broken family, a broken home, a family that had spiritually and physically went down and brought security and comfort when they came back. And just remember our greater than Boaz, the Lord Jesus. He came from glory to Bethlehem. And there he moved out in grace, marvellous grace, for the salvation of lost mankind. And let me remind you, dear friends, the Lord Jesus is still in the business of mending broken homes and healing fragmented families. And he can do it through the marvellous gift of salvation. And dear child of God, whatever it is you need at this time, 
you can find it at the feet of Christ. Maybe it's stability. The old work front isn't shaping up too good with isolation and lockdown. My friend, get to the feet of Christ. The health of family, friends and their future is uncertain. Get to the feet of the Lord Jesus. Maybe it possibly could be you're anxious about, you, about how you stand before God. You're not saved. My friend, like Ruth, falling at the feet of Boaz. You too can fall at the feet of the Lord Jesus. He's your only hope, mind you. He's the only answer to all your needs. And there's absolutely nothing that his grace cannot supply. Oh, friends, the bountiful supply of grace that Ruth found at the feet of Boaz. And oh, the beauty of this field picturing for us what it is to enter into the goodness of God's gospel graces. So we saw a friend of great standing, Boaz, the mighty man of wealth, in chapter 2, verse 1. And then the field as a picture of salvation. But last week we saw the field as a picture of the scriptures. Ruth, as soon as she entered the field of grace, she became a labourer. She wasn't, she wasn't, as we would call them, a, a lout or a layabout. She laboured. You know, I find it interesting about Ruth's character as well. She didn't expect Naomi to go and glean in the field. She took that labour upon herself. Oh, my friends, years of service for Christ are best carried out when you're young. When you have the stamina and the energy and the vigour to keep at it. Don't think you need to wait until you're older to serve the Saviour or to labour in the field. Can I encourage you to pour your life into service for Christ now? For there's things, there's things you can do when you're young that you just won't be fit for when you're older. Ruth didn't say, I'll just let Naomi go to the field. I'll just put my feet up here and sit back and relax. No, she went herself. And so can I encourage you all, give yourself to him in the field of service and give yourself to him as we thought last week in the field of the scriptures. But today as I alluded to again last Lord's Day, we're going to be thinking about the field as the field of separation. Now I'm taking verse 21 in Ruth chapter 2 as my springboard into this thought. Look what chapter 2, 21 says. And Ruth the Moabites said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And then if you just glance your eye uh, back up chapter 2 there to verses 8 and 9 to the words, the words that left, the command that left Boaz's lips. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels, and drink of that which the young men have drawn. You would say to me, the way Boaz spoke to Ruth here sounds very much like a command, doesn't it? Well, friends, after looking at it, I think it is a command. I think it will be hard uh, to, to not see it as anything else than a command. Boaz says to Ruth, listen to it, Go not to glean in another field. Abide here, fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. We saw in a previous study that Boaz had the right 
the right to decide whether Ruth gleaned in his field or not because it was his field. But then you might say to me, well that's okay, he holds the right to allow her into the field or not, but surely he can't make her stay only in his field and go nowhere else. Well friends, I think he can. And I think this brings out the love and concern of Boaz for Ruth. If we take the time to remember the character of Boaz, who he is and, and what he is like, there's no one else in Bethlehem like him. If anyone has the qualities to make such a command, it's Boaz. You know, he knows what goes on out in those other fields. He knows what kind of dangers are lurking around the corner for young women like Ruth. He knows if she is to find peace and safety and future blessing, it will only be found in his field and none other. And friends, here's just a little truth of separation for the child of God. There is one who saved us by his grace. He loves us. He is concerned about us. He only wants what is good for us. We don't doubt it for a second. But if we are to have peace and safety and future blessing, it will only be found in the places that are approved by Christ and his word and nowhere else. What I find interesting is how Boaz gets Ruth's attention. Look how Boaz gets her attention in verse number 8. Hearest thou not, my daughter? This would have been said out for all to hear. Hearest thou not, my daughter? Boaz is saying, listen. Are you listening to what I have to say to you, Ruth? Because it's very important. That word, hearest, means to give your undivided attention. To hear with the desire to obedience. Boaz uh, didn't want her just to listen to what he had to say and then for her just to go off and do her own thing. If you've children, you will have witnessed this many times over the years. There's something maybe you don't want them to do or maybe something you do want them to do. And you explain it a number of times and you think you have their undivided attention. But I've come to realise that children seem to have the gift of looking at you with those big eyes like they're taking it all in. And when you have your back turned, they're off doing the very same thing again. But not so with Ruth. Ruth listened. Ruth, for Ruth, this was a command from Boaz for her undivided attention and with a view to obey. Why? Because he cared for her welfare. Ruth listened. Not only listened, or as they say in our country, it went in one ear and out the other ear. No, it didn't go in one ear and out the other ear. She listened and she obeyed. We see that when we get to the end of the chapter. And I just wonder, friends, as we begin to look at the truth of separation, just in a small way. We're going to by no means cover all the scriptures, for there's many of them. But just looking at the truth of separation in a small way, just if you like, in a pictorial sense, here in Ruth chapter 2, would we be willing to give our undivided attention to the truth of God's word? When God says to us, Hearest thou not, my son, or hearest thou not, my daughter, would we be willing to hear with a view to obedience? Not just to be hearers of the word only, as James says, but to be doers. For those who know to do something and do it not, to them it is sin, says James also. Be willing to hear, but to hear with a view to obey. And the more I look at the Christian scene and Christendom in general, I think the truth of separation in the life of the believer today has been kicked to the sidelines. We seem to think 
that we can take the title Christian and still engage in the things of the world. But as I read through my Bible, I realize over and over and over again that that's not the case. You would agree with me that after Boaz had given the command to Ruth to be separate and to glean only in his field, if she was to go off to another and do her own thing, it would be deeply disrespectful to the one who had showed such grace. But yet there's many scriptures in God's word. Many scriptures that, that we will mention, we'll mention a few in a moment, that call for the Christian's undivided attention and unswerving disobedience. Obedience. But we go on as if we had never heard them at all. You see, we will find when we get to the end of the little book of Ruth that ultimately Boaz will purchase Ruth for himself. He will pay a price for her redemption and she will belong to him. And I think this is where we, as those who have been redeemed, need to begin on the truth of our separation. Before we go into the various commands that he has given us, we need to know that we are his. This is an elementary truth. It's 1 Corinthians six nineteen and 20. What, says the Apostle Paul? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Do ye not know these things? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The end of this chapter is, is really speaking very specifically on our purity. But nevertheless, the truth presented applies to all Christians who are redeemed. Ye are not your own for or because. Ye are bought with a price. My dear friend, dear child of God, have you come to realise in your Christian walk that the Lord Jesus Christ has bought you? That the Lord Jesus Christ owns you? Owns you? That word bought is the truth of redemption. And that's exactly what we're thinking about in this series in Ruth. The intention for redemption. Christ paid the price of his own precious blood to seal our forgiveness and freedom. If he bought us, he owns us. And he has the right to tell us how to live our lives. If anyone has a right, it is Christ and his word. I tell you, friends, we don't like to be owned. We like to be able to do our own thing and go our own way and submit to no one and no thing. But listen, the truth of redemption tells us we have been bought. Bought with the greatest price the world has ever seen. The precious blood of Christ. He owns us, and he has a right to tell us exactly how we should live. Later on in 1 Corinthians 7.23, the Apostle Paul says similar words with a little extra bit at the end. He says in 1 Corinthians 7.23, Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. The word servants, it's the Greek word doulos, it's a slave. Be not slaves of men. My friends, think of it. If we're not slaves of men, who are we to be slaves of? Well, the previous verse says we are to be slaves of Christ. Do you realise that a slave has no rights? Do you realise a slave can't pick and choose what duties he or she wants to do? Can't decide if they want to do this or do that? A slave must do what they're told. But remember friends, we have a loving master who only wants our good. He will not ask us to do anything that will ruin us. So then we ought to be willing to obey. 
So keep in your mind, as we think about separation and obedience to God's word, we have been bought. We are no longer our own, we belong to Christ. Therefore, he has the claims to our life and how we should live as redeemed children. I want, just in the time we have left, just to pick up those three phrases that, that Boaz uses to exhort Ruth in verses 8 and 9. Just apply them to ourselves as, we would, as they would come from the mouth of the Lord. Go not. Abide here. Let thine eyes. Here are three great commands regarding separation. First of all, go not. We're not to go to places that are opposed to godliness. Places that have no time for Christ and his word. I'm not just thinking about the very obvious places that a Christian shouldn't be in, like the pubs and the clubs. And if you can't see that those dens are no place for a Christian, it's not separation you need, but it's salvation. And I know because I was in them. Professing to be a Christian, I don't think I was saved at all. But there is many places that professing believers go to. And many things they do, and they're against separation. And they're against the word of God because they have been blurred. And they have been sidelined, as I have said, in these days. You know, you're maybe sitting on the edge of your seat, waiting for me to give you a few examples of places. But my friends, my friends, it's not about that. It's not about doing this and it's not about doing that and, and not doing this and, and me giving you a list of do's and don'ts. That's not Christianity or separation. If you love the Lord Jesus Christ and you have the witness of the Holy Spirit, you will know if that's the place a Christian should be in or not. Does it exalt Christ? Could the Lord Jesus go? Does it make you want to grow spiritually in the Lord? Proverbs 23 verse 20 says, Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of the flesh. Here we're told in Proverbs, here's one place anyway, we're not to be among those who consume alcohol or who are given to excess eating. And the consumption of drink and gluttony always go hand in hand in the scriptures. And anywhere there is great feasts of food, you will usually get alcohol. We're to be separate from them. Proverbs 4, 14 and 15 says, Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not into the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it. And pass away. Regarding the wicked path of evil and unsaved men and women, we are to avoid it. Don't even pass by it. And if we do, we are to turn and pass away. That's that's a pretty conclusive text concerning the separation of the believer from all things that are evil. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. You see, Boaz not only tells Ruth to go not, but to abide here. He doesn't just, he doesn't just tell her not to do something, but he gives her something right and wholesome to do in its place. And if we separate ourselves from sin and worldliness and don't do X, Y or Z, but don't fill that void with good things, it won't be long until some other idol fills the gap. Ephesians 4, 22 and 24 says these words, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, that word conversation just means manner of life former ways. Did you put off your, your former conversation, your former manner of life, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts? 
Just remember, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we have been crucified with him, but we still, we still have the lusts of the flesh, part of the old man. This old man is still very much alive within us. And we must put him off. See, Paul says put off in verse 22. But then in verse 23, he says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And in verse 24, he says, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Paul just doesn't say put off, put off, put off. You see, he says, when you put something off that is evil, put on something that is holy to fill the void. We're not to abide in sin and evil, but in that which is good and godly. And this is also the teaching of Psalm chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. You can see clearly in this chapter as well that there's a putting off and a putting on. Not walking, standing, or sitting in evil pursuits, putting off, but meditating in God's word day and night, putting on. You can see the void is being filled with that which is holy, with that which is righteous, with that which is pure. Setting our affections not on the things of earth, but on the things above. Putting off, but then more importantly, putting on. We get it in Romans chapter 12 as well. To be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. There's the putting off, not to be conformed to this world. And the putting on, to be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that ye may prove what is that good, acceptable, and holy, perfect will of God. Putting off, putting on. So always make sure when you're putting off certain things, or you're looking to go on with the Lord in holiness, what do you put off? Make sure you put something holy and godly and pure in its place to fill the void. Putting off, putting on. So we see Boaz says to Ruth, go not. And then he says to Ruth, abide here. Abide here. Tells her something to put off. And then he gives her something to put on. And finally Boaz talks about her eyes. Let thine eyes be on the field. My friend, the grass always looks greener on the other side. The far fields from home maybe look prosperous, but if they're going to compromise the scriptures and your walk, they're better left alone. Paul says to the Thessalonians concerning their eyes, 1 Thessalonians 5.22, Abstain from all appearance of evil. Be careful what we watch. Be careful what we see. It's the very appearance of evil. Friends, let's get our eyes off evil and onto the field. Let us be filled with the truth of our salvation. Let us be filled with the study of the scriptures and live holy and separate lives and never be guilty. Oh, may God help us to be never found guilty of shaking hands with the world that put our Saviour on the cross. So you can see just our final message in chapter 2. The field is a picture of separation. Go not, go not, to glean in another field. Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my Harvest. Friends, let us in these days seek to be those who love the Lord. Seek to be those who are marked out as being separate. Seek to be those who are holy and live godly lives. That we might not be ashamed at his coming. 
Remember, John reminds us in his epistle to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Oh, that we would set our affections on Christ and see him as our all in all and be satisfied with all that Christ has given to us through salvation. May the Lord again bless his word and trust you will be able to join us again next Lord's Day as we move into chapter 3. Shall we pray? Father, we thank thee again for thy goodness to us. We thank thee, Father, for some of these wonderful truths in thy word concerning our salvation and our separation. And Father, the scriptures. And we just pray, Lord, that we might be those who are shut out to the world and, and shut up with thee. That, Father God, we might know what it is to get closed in with thee in these days. And, Father, glean uh, all the beautiful things out of thy word. Father, bless us, we pray. Keep thine hand of safety and blessing upon all thy dear children again for good. And pray, Father God, we might have gleaned something from this passage again that might help us and benefit us in these days in which we live. We pray all these things in thy blessed name. Amen.